All right, folks, so welcome to part two of our Frederick Nietzsche lecture. Part one obviously discussed the whole concept of the will to power, how as long as there is life, there is an underlying force that permeates the existence of all forms of life, and that is the aspect of power relationships. Wherever there is life, there is command and there is obedience. This is an inescapable phenomenon, according to Frederick Nietzsche. Well, another inescapable phenomenon for Frederick is the whole idea of the Ubermensch. Or if you're taking this class for Westworld, you could kind of call it the Uberfrau. Uh, Ubermensch from German is translated into Overman, um, but its more popular meme <laughs> is the Superman. Right, and this is all about, well, if you go back to our master-slave will to power lecture, we realize that if life exists because of these power relationships, it can't exist without it, then there's always something that's going to arise from this relationship, right? If you go back to Hegel, with every thesis and antithesis, you have a synthesis, right? With every, look in Taoism, with every yin and yang, you don't have two, but you actually have this somehow combination of three, which is the gray, right? So every relationship produces something. And what the master-slave morality relationship, per, like what it distributes in our society is either a person that falls on one side of the coin, master slave, or, or we get in matrix speak the anomaly, right? Or we get the outlier in sociology. We get the person who strives to become not only more, more than what society says can exist, more than what tradition says is acceptable, they are the beacon, the paragon of progress. They usually represent truth, a higher truth in one way or another. And how this person is created is exactly what this lecture is about. The steps and the processes to becoming the Ubermensch, according to Frederick Nietzsche. Now, obviously in his book, The Villa Zermacht, the Ubermensch is rather rhetorically and a poetically beautifully way to express how a human can become. If you go back to Hegel, remember how a dialectic fuels a zeitgeist, right? Well, the Kickstarter to a dialectic, you can, con you can actually consider an Ubermensch. For the Ubermensch is the creator of a new value system that people just want to follow. But it does take a step-by-step -step process to get there. But likewise, if a zeitgeist, remember, that's the I that is we and the we that is I. This is when a soul representative stands at the forefront of all human society, progress and thought, and says, this is what we are. This is who we are. This is what I am, and what I am is who we are, right? That's what Hegel was arguing. But that person who represents that, Frederick Nietzsche took the reins and said, that is called an Ubermensch. Now, that connection isn't tied directly, but to connect the two philosophies so you can see how they're interdependent, it's a good way of thinking about it. So what we're going to focus on is... How does the will to power, how does this whole duality of master-slave, how does it give birth to the Ubermensch, and how does the Ubermensch go on the step-by-step -step processes to achieve over-manhood, <laughs> or in the case of Westworld, like uber-frauhood, like over-womanhood. So, to begin with, for the Ubermensch, Remember, life is a constant struggle. It's a constant struggle because we exist in these power relationships, right? We're, you know, 
Wherever there's slave, there's master. Wherever there's masters, there's slave. You know, there's always this consistent struggle between of power between the two. Now, this lifelong struggle is a three-step process that Nietzsche says every human must go through before they can achieve the status of Ubermensch. And like I said, if you're taking this class for Westworld, just think about it as these are the three stages that a host would have to go through in order to become like a Martin Luther King for robots or something like that. Anyway, so it begins, so every person that seeks to become an Ubermensch begins at stage one, which is called the camel, all right? Now, remember, Nietzsche likes to speak in poetic metaphor, so all of his reasonings and explanations are metaphorical, for example, saying that everyone begins their life as a camel is poetic, right? So all of us start here in the camel phase. We're born here, right? And according to Nietzsche, about 99% of us are going to stay here. We are going to be, in essence, a willful beast of burden, right? The camel is very akin to being in that herd mentality, to, to embracing a slave mentality of always wanting others to provide for them or wanting uh, somehow finding, wanting and finding virtue and remember slave type of, slave type of virtues, right? I mean, that's the best that can be said. Um, and so these are the type of people that generally accept without challenge the belief systems that they were raised in. You know, if they're the type of person that says, the way that I've always been raised must be the right way, everyone else is just foreign and alien and wrong, generally those people will never escape the camel stage, right? And as you know, you can just look around at all the stupid people and they generally have this kind of belief because learning something new, alien and foreign, is not in their wheelhouse or they just can't possibly understand it. So someone that can't possibly understand the multifaceted concepts and just why life is chaotic and technical, not simple anymore. Well, you can understand then why someone who has those belief systems that they're right and they've been raised to be always right can never generally find a role, like a diplomatic role or a compromising role in the greater vision of reality. So the reason behind this, according to Nietzsche, is he says, when you look at how most people interact with the world, they carry themselves as willful beasts of burden, right? They feel guilt thrown upon them by their parents, right? Or when their friends say, well, I did this for you, can't you do this for me? Like people who take on the burden of other people's desires, of other people's will, when they carry the burden, that's why they're called a camel, right? Because they don't seek that individuality of saying, well, to hell with what you want. This is actually what I desire. They don't, they don't embrace that type of men, that thinking. They don't embrace that type of virtuous thinking that a master morality would embrace. So if they don't embrace it, they have to embrace the opposite end, which is the master-like mentality and that's what he calls, Nietzsche calls the camel, right? Think of life as a camel, right? Camels carry things. They don't complain and they behave the way others tell them to behave, right? Kind of like a horse, right? So Nietzsche says that just like the camel, we carry the burdens of other people's expectations. We carry and submit to the traditions and limits of other camels. In other words, the herd mentality. Right? So as long as you exist and find comfort in doing what other people do, you know, the whole birds of a feather flock together. Essentially, if you don't seek to be different, if you don't seek to embrace your uniqueness, if you don't seek to be a contrarian 
and go against the norm, you're generally always gonna be considered a camel, right? And like I said, camels, nine times out of 10, always practice the, mass, the slave morality, all right? However, once a person, I, moving on to our second step, right? So if we're all born as a camel, right? This willful beast of burden, well then how do we escape it? Well, folks, now comes one of Frederick Nietzsche's, probably one of his most famous quotations. You could Google anywhere and find this quotation by Frederick Nietzsche. And he says, God is dead and we have killed him. And this is dot, dot, dot. And this is a glorious thing. But what does he mean by, and God is dead and we have killed him? Well, this comes, this quotation leads to step number two in becoming an Ubermensch, and that's becoming the lion, right? So we started as a camel, now we become the lion, right? And the lion sees all tradition, all camels, as, you know, slaves to these man made traditions, right? We may want to make tradition sacred by saying they come from some holy source, but in reality, when you boil it down to where the origin, the genesis point of all those ideas came from, they, they all come from a man. So Nietzsche argues in history, argues, proves actually. So if all traditions are just man-made and all morality is just man-made, then what the hell does God is dead and we have killed him means? Well, according to Nietzsche, he uses another metaphor to kind of explain this of a fire-breathing dragon, right? The fire-breathing dragon is like this whole, this concept of non-humanness, this eternal external force that somehow like keeps us in line with its own rules and its own expectations. And so too, as a fire breathing dragon can keep us in control. Well, so too Nietzsche believed that ideas of religion and the ideas of God keep us under control. And that is a fault. That is a fault because according to Nietzsche, why are we gonna listen to something that's not human tell a human what to do. Nietzsche thought this was absurd, is equally as absurd as us getting political, like humans getting political advice from an ant. Why are we gonna listen to an ant tell us what to do? Likewise, Nietzsche thought it was equally absurd to think, why should we think a non-human God tell a human what to do. I know, it's sad, Riker. And so the, <laughs> the whole, you know, outcome of this kind of epiphany for Nietzsche was that when one reached this inescapable conclusion that one would become a lion, one would become a lion, and this is where a slave can literally become a master because he called the fire-breathing dragon the idea of thou shalt, you know, going back to your Ten Commandments, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that, right? Well, he called the fire-breathing dragon thou shalt, and upon each scale of the dragon was thou shalt do and thou shalt what not do. But once a lion has identified these burdens and these traditions that we've accepted, the lion can then make a free choice, can make a free decision, express their will to power. And by exercising one's will to power, can a person then escape the traditions that they've been burdened with? That's when a lion literally has a lion's roar and says, to hell with you, camel. You know, you say this is the way to be, 
this is the way that I say I am, right? So the lion versus the camel is the equivalent of saying, what is the me versus us debate? What's better, me or us? And that goes back to master-slave. Remember, masters prefer the glory of the individual rather than the glory of the herd. The philosophy of the slaves is the glory of the herd rather than the glory of the individual. Well, a lion says to hell with what the, the, the herd, to hell with what the camels think. Camels are camels for a reason because they get ridden by men. Or in this metaphor, a camel is always going to be a slave in the food chain to a damn lion, right? Remember, there's only one rule of the jungle. When the lion is hungry, he eats. Same thing applies to humanity, right? So consequently, breaking away from tradition, Nietzsche realizes can create, okay, if the lion is step two, step two A Think about it as a fork in the road. Because Nietzsche realizes that once a person reaches this stage of lionhood, that they then understand, hey, all the stuff that I've been raised to thought, to believe was good, right, wrong, etc. Everything I was raised to think was right, in actuality is like one-tenth of the bigger picture, that my parents didn't know everything, right? And once you realize that a lot of the stuff you are raised to believe is right, once you realize that it's not, Nietzsche admits that a person can fall into a state of what's called nihilism, right? And nihilism is like almost, think of a black hole, a void, a type of limbo where morality, good, evil, time, future, past, present, none of these things exist. That nihilism believes that, hey, we, life is just a virus that has infected mother nature and through the process of entropy, life is just eating away, burning all the resources, energy, everything good from the planet. And rather than fight that nature, we should just embrace it and say to hell with it. And why even practice law, morality? Because nothing matters, right? That's kind of a nihilistic state. It's like the equivalent of when a rock star goes into some sort of depression and then finds escape in sex, drugs, or rock and roll, right? They are escaping into a state of nihilism because they realize that really what they do doesn't matter in life. It's just literally a drop in the bucket of an ocean of life, of reality. So this fork in the road is called nihilism, that's what it is. But what that fork in the road is caused by, what creates the split of passive nihilism and active nihilism is suffering. Now, Nietzsche made it a point to find virtue in suffering. And a lion accepts the emotion of suffering. For Nietzsche says that when a person experiences suffering, can they, and only then, have a shift in consciousness or have a shift in the way that they perceive the world? In other words, the only way to change how you perceive reality is by experiencing suffering. Because without suffering, all we would have is complacency. We would just be in a stale, stagnant society. We would just find comfort in comfort's sake. Right, But the problem is, is comfort in a comfort sake is like saying, well, the virtue of a cloud is that it produces the hardened, the hardened vigor of another cloud. Well, that's pretty weak, right? No, you want the old quotation that says iron sharpens iron, right? 
that something rough and tough is going to give birth to something equally rough and tough, right? And that is the virtue of suffering. For if you coddle and spoil whoever you raise, you're just going to have a coddled and spoiled adult, right? But if you, you know, I guess it's that biblical quotation of what spare the rod, spoil the child. That is the virtue of suffering, according to Nietzsche. It's, and when he says that only suffering can change a shifting consciousness, what he means, and I'll give you two examples. If you've ever known someone who has had PTSD from war or say someone who has experienced some form of sexual abuse, right, rape or whatever, you would notice that the person they were before that moment of apex suffering who they were before that moment was probably person A and who they were afterwards was person B, right? Because that moment of intense suffering changed how they perceived humans and all of reality. And this is why Nietzsche says that, you know, we just kind of, you know, shit's going to happen. If shit's going to happen, you can't avoid it you can't deny it well then we got to find a way to control it we got to find a way to domesticate the shit that's going to happen to your life and the only way to do so is to view suffering as a virtue because suffering is going to happen anyway but how we come out of suffering remember the fork in the road is completely upon us so once suffering has happened right um because like i said only when a person suffers do they change how they approach life so that they can avoid the emotional suffering that they once felt and obviously try to find a path forward that seeks to fulfill that avoidance. Um, now, subsequently, Nietzsche says that once a lion has removed themselves from burden and they exist in this state of suffering, so going back to the idea of um, ideas in your existential state suffering, is you reach that fork in the road of nihilism because once you have to suffer the idea well jesus the first 18 years of my life i was taught that a b and c were right little did i know that a b and c are just the first three letters in a 26 letter alphabet right that's the best case scenario that you were raised by smart parents but only knew third three out of 26 aspects of reality. Then you got the opposite end where people don't, you know, you're raised in a family where they have more DVDs on their shelf than books, in which case they just may say A and B are the only things that exist in reality and they're unaware of the other letters, right? Obviously, the more you know, the more power you have, right? But going back to this, if you were taught that A, B, and C were wrong, that actually that these other letters existed in the alphabet. Well, Nietzsche says that that can create this type of, you're just emotionally distraught. You're just like, damn, here I go thinking my parents, I put them on a damn pedestal. Little did I know there was a reason why when I kept asking questions, they said, I don't know. I don't know. God, that was so frustrating. Little did I know. They didn't know, right? And so that kind of suffering where you just realize what you were raised to be wrong or just insufficient can create this type of nihilism where just because what my parents taught me to be right and wrong, well, once I understand that they're just a little piece of the picture, I can either take one path of the fork in the road, which is called active nihilism, or I can take the other path, which is called passive nihilism, and definitely know this fork for the exam. Because passive nihilism, remember, well, to use a metaphor to explain the difference, let's consider an ocean and a surfer, right? An ocean wave and a surfer. A passive nihilist would be someone who says, okay, now that I realize that what I was taught was wrong or insufficient, 
Now that I talk, understand that, I can either choose to be a passive nihilist, which is when every, you realize everything in the world is man-made, even life itself is meaningless, right? That, you know, you realize that you are a surfer that is riding the wave of nihilism, but rather than ride the wave, you let the wave envelop you. You let it overtake you because you come to this understand why fight the wave? The wave is gonna wind anyway because I'm gonna fall over on my surfboard anyway. So why fight it? Just let it take me, right? This is passive nihilism where you just say nothing in the world matters. So who gives a damn? Whatever will be, will be, right? Nietzsche would say people who exhibit a passive nihilistic state or those who traverse that path are those who generally have a low will to power. But on the other hand, you have the active nihilists, right? And the active nihilist is when the lion comes to the same understanding as a passive nihilist that realizing that, hey, there is no real meaning to life that the only meaning that you have is the meaning that you trailblaze before you, right? Um, that's what an active nihilist believes. Uh, to read what he says, uh, an active nihilist is when the lion comes to the same understanding as a passive nihilist, but rather than allowing yourself to be overtaken by a wave of nothingness, the active nihilist taps into his higher will to power and seeks to create their own path. They truly make the life they want to live, right? Free of any limitations that were placed upon them when they were a camel. So in other words, when you become a lion and say no to society, to no to tradition, to know to other people's expectations when you say, hear me roar, I am not one of you, I am myself. You have reached the state of lionhood, but to reach that state of lionhood, you when you say, hear me roar, I am myself, not you, you're also saying to hell with your traditions, to hell with your expectations. The only thing that matters is my expectations my going back to what Nietzsche said about show me someone within without an ego and I'll show you a loser right someone who doesn't tap into their ego will fall by way of the path of the surfer who gets overtaken by the wave but the active nihilist well he's the surfer that decides to ride the wave that says yeah I know I'm gonna fall down at the end of this but damn it, if I ain't gonna go out in style. And so rather than let the wave overtake them, they decide to domesticate, to harness, to saddle that wave, and they ride it to completion. And they know they're gonna fall at the end, but how they got to the end, well, that's what matters. That's what's the fucking juice. And that's why a lion generally has to accept the path of active nihilism to get to the third step. For a lion that accepts the path of passive nihilism will not make it to the third step because there's no point in taking a third step. But an active nihilist also says, what's next? Give it to me. And what is next is step three, the child. This is the final step to becoming an Ubermensch because according to Nietzsche, the difference between the child and the lion is, and I quote, I'm going to read this verbatim. But say, my brothers, what could the child do that the lion cannot? Why must the brave lion become a child? Because the child is innocence, it's forgetting. The child is a new beginning. It's a game, a self-propelled wheel. The child is a first movement. A child is the sacred yes. For the game of creation, my brothers, a sacred yes is needed. The spirit of the individual now wills its own will. 
and he who has been lost to the world now creates his own world. See, this is what I meant earlier when I said that Nietzsche writes in rhetorical poetic metaphor. And I like to recite that because there is something beautiful to it, but let us get down to a clinical explanation of what he meant, and let's get to the point. Remember as a lion, you're saying no to everything, right? Hear me roar, not hear us speak, right? Hear me roar. But when you are the child, you are life affirming. You always say yes to everything. And that's because a child, just like in real life, really doesn't have any burdens placed upon them. Have you ever heard the, you know, the motto, you know, the, the honesty and innocence of a child knows no other? Because really a child doesn't know yet to lie. They'll say things between adults that were only meant to be secret, that were only meant to be uh, said in house, not shared amongst the public. You know, child, children don't know this. So being in this third stage mirrors a child at play. Children who are discovering the world for the first time. This is what all humans should be striving for, in particular an Ubermensch. Because once they reach a new stage, once they reach a stage where people want to follow them, where they are wise enough to be intelligent enough to justify their lionhood st status, that they need to be seeking and looking towards the future. And if we go back to our will to power lecture, remember that the number one virtue that Nietzsche highlighted was creativity. And who is not the epitome of pure, genuine creativity than the mind of a child, right? A mind of a child isn't corrupted or polluted by the biases and the influences of the world. No, they can create genu genuinely new <laughs> abstractions that human beings never thought of. Like, who thought it would be wise to put, you know, Vicks Vapor Rub on the Cheez-Its? Well, this child did because they wanted both taste and fragrance. <laughs> like a, an adult would find that stupid, but a child would think it would be the height of creativity because they're just not experienced enough to know what society has deemed appropriate and inappropriate. And in that way, you know, Nietzsche says, this is what we should be striving for because it's a new and creative way of looking at things and allows us to become masters of our own reality and the creators of new values. Right? And that is the goal of when you are a child, is when you are a child, you know, this is after you have graduated from the stage of being a lion. And if you're a lion, you said no, no, no to all traditions and norms. Well, it's not enough to say no to everything, because if you just say no to everything, you're just kind of embracing anarchy. Well, to have more, to have substance, to have an appreciation of things that are creative, you have to be in a state of being where you can create something that warrants other people to say yes. It's not enough to just say no. It's not enough to just disprove something. You also have to prove, you have to you know, if you're going to disprove a truth, generally you have to provide another truth in its replacement for people to bite on. And only someone who has a high will of creativeness, that has a high ability to create, can replace the old system, the old way of thinking, with a new way of thinking, right? And this is why it's called the child, because the child is no longer influenced by their traditions, they're no longer influenced by what should be. They're more inspired as to what could be, right? Thanos from the Infinity War is coming to mind, but I don't want to get my metaphors confused. But either way, this is the path to becoming an Ubermensch, right? Starts with being a camel. You're just a beast of burden. You're just doing everything 
that your family, that your community, that your friends expect you to do. Like I said, most people never escape this. Just look at Facebook. <laughs> most people post things that make them look good to their friends and their peers. Very rarely do you get someone that goes to stage two, which is your lions. Your lions are the ones that say to hell with convention and norm, to hell with your traditions because this is just a herd slave-like way of thinking. I am a master, I am a lion, there's only one rule, when I'm hungry, I eat, right? So to hell with what you say I can do, I'm going to do what I think I could do. And when you think you could do something, that's when you become the child. The child says, now that I've embraced the no, to saying to hell with you parents, to hell with you tradition, to hell with you society, I'm going to go towards what is generally considered right. This zeitgeist, remember this ever-changing, evolving movement of the spirit of the times. And you too are changing and evolving. That's why you evolve from camel to lion. And you say, well, mom, dad, or grandma, whoever, you know, the way you thought back then may have been right. The zeitgeist at the time may have supported your way of thinking. Unfortunately, this isn't 10, 20 years ago, and the zeitgeist has changed, which means if it's changed, I can no longer fall on the wrong side of history, right? And that's one thing, to, one way of viewing what you believe to be right or wrong, is if you're smart enough to look at the big picture, not just your own subjective experience, but the big picture, if you ever have students or a child, ask yourself this question, which Nietzsche would also advocate. What side of history do you want to fall on? Do you want to fall on the side of history that was bigoted, racist, sexist, homophobic, all that kind of stuff? Well, nowadays we would just call those people backwards or unawoke, right? But nowadays, you have to kind of be the opposite of all those things to be considered awoke, right? And to be awoke, you have to generally be a lion and say no to what we thought was true and right 10, 15 years ago. So if that is you, then you are in the state of lionhood. But if you never create, or if you never trailblaze a new path of progress innovation and change, you'll just stay a lion. But to take this next step of innovation, change, and progress, you have to be the child. All right? So when thinking about these three steps, just think about the characters from the show or the movie. Who has gone along this path? Who has said God is dead? Who has become the child, the creator of new values and new morals for the new herd, for the new camels to follow? Who has done that, right? Nietzsche would kind of argue that, you know, your Thomas Jefferson's, um, if, Frederick, if uh, Martin Luther King didn't believe in God and were an atheist, he would have been an ubermensch. Napoleon could have been considered an ubermensch. Uh, if you really put the feet to the fire, you could get political philosophers to say Obama was an ubermensch just because he rejected the norm, created something new, the universal health care, uh, and which was a benefit to all, right? We've tried to reverse it with our new president, but it's just failed. It's failed because the majority of human society has just kind of accepted that this new progressive way of thinking eh, was probably the most justified right way of thinking. Everyone just kind of deserves to be healthy, <laughs> right? So uh, this is how you can measure the, how a zeitgeist is fueled by a dialectic, by a dial, but a dialectic is kick-started by an ubermensch. And this is how you can say the German philosophers, Hegel and Nietzsche, can be related, is that if you view philosophy as 
the life and times of a fictional character, then just as like a fictional hero in a movie would create vast change of the better for whatever its society or whatever plot it's serving, well, so too does an Ubermensch. An Ubermensch is what kickstarts the dialectic, so thesis, antithesis, and out of this battle, you get either get a compromise or a resolution called a synthesis. And that synthesis can inspire and create a new spirit of the times, can create a new zeitgeist. But none of that can happen without an Ubermensch. And how you become an Ubermensch is by going along this threefold path that is inspired by the idea of God is dead to the fork in the road of passive and active nihilism to becoming a child, which at the end of the day would be the creator of new values, of new truths about the nature of our existence, right and wrong, good and evil, beauty and glory. Yeah. So folks, that is the Ubermensch, the Overman. Know it, know it well. Peace out.